Welcome to this playoff edition of Press Row, joined as always by Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz, I'm Matt Finkel. Week 11's finally here. We made it. Season went fast, <laughs> I feel like. I don't know for yeah, you guys. Yeah, I agree but, with you on yeah. that one. They always do. They, always they get do. faster. Yeah, so 10 weeks down. Week 11, we've got some great local matchups. 24 area teams into the postseason. What is the best matchup coming up Friday or Saturday? I, from the get-go, Columbus Grove, Pandora, Gilboa. When I saw that was a potential matchup on Friday night, I just started rubbing my hands because that's you look back to where the, how those two teams started. You're playing against each other. It's a great game back in week one. Five miles separates the two schools. The communities overlap each other. They hate, love each other. They hate each other. It's a rivalry. It's what you want to see. And I don't see how you can get much better than that on, on week 11 to see Grove and Pandora go head-to-head head head again. Yeah, Some good-looking guys got that game on Saturday night for WOSN, <laughs> too. That, that's a no-brainer with that one. Uh, you, you, to get a rivalry game in the first round of the playoffs is great. Uh, so Spencerville Crestview would have to be a close second. Speaking of rivalry games, what about Wayne Trace Tenor, guys? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a dandy, a good one too. Eight, I, I, that. I, I'm not going to lie. That, I went with that number one. With all due respect to Grove Pandora, because I've got that one, I didn't want to have to pull a Herb Street, you know, and only get <laughs> keys to it. But I would say Tenora, Wayne Trace, Crestview, Spencerville, top two, and then Grove Pandora. And uh, it, the week 11 really, I think, sets up at, at whole um, to be a very interesting week. Well, you look at the history of Wayne Trace, Tenora. A year ago, Tenora won the regular season game. Yep. Wayne Trace yeah. beat him in the playoffs en route to the state runners up. This year, Tenora beat Wayne Trace in the regular season. Now they're meeting the playoffs once again. Two weeks ago, yeah. just in week nine, it was 40 to 24. It was actually a game that Wayne Trace had an opportunity, had a pick six, got the ball back, turned it over again, and Tenora scored on that, capitalized and scored there. That was really the difference in that game. And I think Bill Speller from Wayne Trace perhaps is, we, we need to be talking about him in a little bit later on about the coach of the year, the job he was able to do with what they lost in terms of graduation from that Wayne Trace team a year ago. And also they had some injuries, some player situations back in August that there's a lot of folks up in the Haviland, Gomer Hill area going, I don't know what we're going to be like football-wise this year. And here they are back in the playoffs, a solid season. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert. <laughs> we'll get to There's a lot of candidates for coaches of the year. Just to mention a couple other intriguing matchups in my mind, two postseason newcomers, Fort Recovery takes on Fort Lormie, and then Van Buren against your Birds. I think that could be a pretty good game. I think both those games could be a very good game. I'm really intrigued to see Saturday night the Fort Laramie fort Recovery game. How does that turn out? Fort Laramie has been there. They're a team that is battle-tested in November where you've got Fort Recovery, who could arguably be the surprise team out of the MAC this year that made the playoffs and got in. And how do they transpire with their first playoff appearance in school history? Well, I, another thing with Fort Recovery, they did not play their best football of the year towards the end of the season. They had no. a tougher schedule, but they're going into the postseason kind of backing their way in, similar to Lima Senior. Fort Recovery is a five seed. What six, seven, or eight seed do you think has the best chance of getting to the regional finals? Well, well let's look think. at the MAC schools that are rated <laughs> low. <laughs> I've got one of those. Yeah, I mean, Versailles, I think, is yeah, one of those candidates. They're the seventh seed in, in their region. And, hey, we know the history of the MAC. When the MAC plays non-MAC schools, particularly in the first couple of rounds, they are really, really, really good. And the other, category, the other MAC school that fits that category, of course, St. John's facing Arlington. I went with Versailles. I also went with Wayne Trace, guys. I think this is Mark alluded to. You know, last year it was in the playoffs. Wayne Trace got to Nora again, and I think that that is a possibility this year of happening. The two teams know each other, like we said. They, they, Wayne Trace to Nora played each other just two weeks ago, so they're going to be pretty fresh in each other's minds still. That could be the best game. That might be the eight-one upset that we see that where the shots are fired, so to speak. I'm going with Jefferson. Uh, I think Jefferson's on a great roll. Uh, they're at Winford, which is a veteran playoff program they're in uh, many, many years. But I like what Jefferson's doing, and they've got to be ultra confident. Their defense is ultra stingy right now, so mm -hmm. that's what you need in the postseason. Uh, I like Jefferson as my dark horse, if you will. Well, and the thing about the Jeff Cats is their hurry-up wing T approach. It takes a while for opposing defenses to get used to that pace mm -hmm. of play and how they do things. Winford, I don't think, is going to be ready for it, quite frankly. We'll, we'll find out, certainly, on Friday night. But th that is a type of offense that you, don't, you can't really prepare for, and until you face it, you don't understand it. Yeah, and you see it, and you're amazed at how quickly they do go up-tempo. It is perplexing, 
And a few weeks ago when I saw it against Spencerville or against LCC, I was raving about it. And Mark, you and I were talking about it. You happened to see it a couple weeks later. You shot me a text that Friday night. It was like, man, this is really impressive how they do this. And last week, it wasn't that Spencerville wasn't prepared for it because they were. They just got into what they wanted to do so quickly. And it all starts up front with that line. It helps this offense tick for Jefferson. I think they've got an excellent chance this week against and, Whitford. You know, another great example of how everything old is new again. <laughs> the hurry up wing T. Somewhere Amos Alonzo Stag is scratching his head. <laughs> I remember covering a scrimmage of theirs about two and a half months ago now and, and not being able to keep up with, uh, with the shots. I was like marking my clips and all of a sudden they're running the next play again. Yep. So it's, I can imagine it's tough for defenses. When they played Ada two weeks ago in week nine, I was there and I was timing it. Their average came out to 3.42 seconds as far wow. as from breaking That's the huddle fast. to snapping the ball. They had three plays in a row, guys, of 1.6 or 1.5 seconds. Wow. That's is insane. Well coached by uh, Chris Summers. Back to for sales for a second. The other interesting thing is that Minster is the only other local team in that area, and they can meet yeah. in the regional semis, I believe. Regional semi. Yeah. Regional semis. Because Minster's a three seed, and right. it would be a the two winner, seven versus a three six. The winner of that game, I would like to come out of that region just based on the pedigree of the MAC. But now let's get to those awards, if you'll call them that. Mm -hmm. Coaches, team, player of the year. There's a lot to talk about and a lot of praise to be doled out, I think. A lot of good jobs. I think team of the year, you got to go Marion Local. Just, you know, they've continued to run the table. They did it with a new quarterback, Doc Rethman, who did get some experience a year ago at the quarterback position when Adam Berkey went down. But the ball just keeps rolling. It just keeps on moving to Marion Local. And what is it, 33 or 38 now, I think? I think it's 33 30 straight. Three, so yeah. that's right. So, Marion Local, hands down, number one as far as my team. Well, I'll go with the Wapton out of Redskins. Like Marion Local, 10 0, but unlike Marion Local, first year head coach Travis Moyer steps in, and, well, Wapak not only doesn't miss a beat, they actually improve the beat. First time they've had an undefeated season since 86. What a job Travis Moore was able to do. Certainly, you know, he had plenty of talent, but just having the talent isn't enough. They were able to get through that WBL schedule unbeaten and have got the top seed in their region. So I, li I like to Wapak as my team of the year. Well, Travis Moore is my coach of the year based on, <laughs> based on the exact reasons that you just mentioned. He, yeah. didn't, he didn't inherit an empty cupboard, that's for certain. But what he did, he took that cupboard, he restocked it, and he added a little bit of spice to it as well. And to go 10-0. Well, look at you keeping the analogy going. <laughs> hey, I have a wife who has a cupboard full of uh, <laughs> spices and stuff. I know what it's like. We'd never <laughs> guess by looking at you. No, <laughs> <Yes>, sir. <laughs> hey, how about Lima Senior? Yeah. And not to yeah. uh, denigrate anybody else what they did, but the way they have revived the community to follow that team and their school uh, deserves a team of the year nod, whether they went 8-0 or 8-2 or 10-0. Uh, just the revival of the uh, community is really worth the team of the year salute. And, but I like where you went with, with Marion Local and with Wapakoneta. Many times we don't give teams that are supposed to win enough credit for actually doing it because supposed to and doing it are two different things. And Marion Local and Wapakoneta were able to do that. Yeah, I also had Kevin Schaup for Van Buren and Brent Niekamp for Fort Recovery, I think. It's always difficult when you have your goal laid out and it's never happened before to actually get over the hump, and I, I think they both did a great job. I want to give an honorable mention to Andy Schaefer at Columbus Grove because, yeah. as I mentioned Sunday night in the bracket preview show, maybe the only people that had Columbus Grove in the playoffs was Coach Schaefer yeah. and his staff. Yeah. And them going six and, you know, they go six and four. <clears throat> They're a three seed at home when a team that, when you look at their schedule, based, just solely based on last year, was you know projected to maybe win two games just yeah. to see what they did. I you know commend them as well. Well, well if we're talking coach of the year, I think a couple of names we yeah. haven't mentioned so far: Brent Fackler, That's step where in I was at going. Kenton. Yeah. What they lost out of that Kenton team from last year. You're talking about four different guys in that roster now on Division One college football rosters. Start off the year 0 and 2. Come back, get into the postseason, get a home game. A fantastic job Brent Fackler has done, and also. In the Western Buckeye League, we've got to mention the job Doug Fry did at St. Mary's. That's what Absolutely. I was going to say. Winless for a couple of years. They come out and have a 5-5 five and five season. Certainly they were better than an 0-10 team last year, but he brought them in, brought back his type of football, and brought back excitement to St. Mary's as well. Yeah. Doug Fry did a fantastic job with Beat St. Me Mary's. Beat me to it. I was going to say, we got to mention Doug Fry going 5-5. Five and five. So, But St. Mary's didn't get into the playoffs. Which team is the best team that won't be playing Week 11? Is it St. Mary's or are they not? A viable option for that? 
Well, I th there's you guys might have others, but OG is the only one yeah. that really springs to mind. I can't think of anybody else that didn't get in. I thought it was a shame. Maybe they should have. OG is the only one. You know, if they were in any other region yes. in Division Five, yep. they would have been in, and in two of the other three, they would have hosted a game. So. Uh, OG really is the only one that springs to mind for me, but you guys might have had others. I went with Elida as one, four and six, two overtime right. losses, what a two seven-point losses, yeah. one three-point loss, turnovers were the bugaboo, and all those deciding losses there. Elida at four and six could have very easily been a team that was seven and three, maybe even eight and two. And from a pure athleticism standpoint, guys, the Bluffton Pirates, they finished three and seven, yeah. a brand new system with Coach, with Coach Cut and all. They only got blown out one game this year, and that was the 40-point loss to yeah. Spencerville. They outscored their opponents by, I think, 40 points or something like that. Yeah. And that's, 85 going into week 10. Right. And Elida outscored their opponents on the season as well. But three and seven, four and six, but I mean, it's with, it's a no-brainer though. O OG without a doubt. We also have the Ayersville Pilots. They were looking like they're going to be in until Jefferson was able to beat Spencerville. Yes. That cost Ayersville their spot in the postseason. And so you, GMC went from having potentially three teams to just the two teams. So Ayersville might be a team that's sitting home this week going, man, we just would have taken care of business. Yeah. And I know the MAC got six teams in, but St. Henry, their four losses, Coldwater Marion, you can excuse those, a one-point loss to Versailles and then a loss to Fort Recovery in a really wild game, back and mm. forth, and a couple Hail, Mar Hail Marys. They actually called a Hail Mary as time expired, but it was out of bounds in the end zone. So they're a good team that will maybe look to get back yeah, to the postseason next year. If only they were in Region 24. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> shouldn't well, we, all of Region 24 except Marion Local, shouldn't we just... <laughs> oh, Marion Local is Region 26. They're 26. Or, that's right, now they're 26. 24 has got St. John's in it, 4 and 6. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was thinking of the other one, but still. It used to be Region 24. Right, so we, so we added the two. <laughs> Back yeah. when, there was a divi when there was a 6 in front Right, of yeah. exactly. So let's finish with the NFL. Browns, Bengals, Thursday night. Big division game for the Browns. This is a big game. When's the last time they had such a big divisional game with Cincinnati? When the Yankees shuffle. Bernie, <laughs> when the people Yankee were shuffle. getting their cold cuts. Getting your cold cuts today, baby. <laughs> well, you know what? Although I will say, in 99, Couch and Akili Smith going head-to-head. -head, that At the time, we thought that was kind of the renaissance of both the Browns and Bengals with these two new quarterbacks. And they thought that was going to be a big deal with Couch and Akili Smith. And right. It didn't quite and work wasn't out that, that way. Wasn't that week two or week three after the Steelers just absolutely bamboozled the Browns 43 nothing? And I think Akili Smith led, led Cincinnati in a late drive to get the winning touchdown. Yeah. I, you know, I did some uh, quick punching in on the Internet with football reference. The last time these two teams played in the second half of the season yep. and both of them had a winning record was 1988. So that's what I'm Bernie. going with. That's Cold a good answer. Cuts, icky yeah. shuffle. That's right. <laughs> That's a good answer. I mean, this is a huge game for the Browns in that Cincinnati's 3-0 and in the division. So even though their records are close overall, you can't let Cincy go to 4-0 and in the division. So. You know, on Sunday, well, flipping through, uh, watching just different games, they were talking about this Browns-Bengals game for Thursday night, just doing a preview. And several of the pundits, I believe it was CBS, said, if the Browns win this game, this validates them as a team that can contend. Yeah. If not... There's the same old Browns. That was the exact point. I think psychologically it's a much bigger game for the Browns. It is. Mm -hmm. And being on the road to get a win would really help them, as Aaron was suggesting. But the thing you got to remember about the Bengals now, their next three are on the road. Yeah, they've played so a lot of home games. So it, it's really incumbent upon them to get this win. And to your point, Matt, if they do, to go to 4-0 in the division and now with the long break before their next game going from Thursday to the following Sunday – gives them a chance to get regrouped and then go on the road. So it's a huge game, and you got to admit it's fun because usually we're just, you know, who <laughs> Laughing. Cares? Yes. Yeah. Well, it will be a lot of fun on Thursday, and then we've got some great high school football postseason week 11 for you Friday and Saturday. That's going to do it for this edition of Press Row. We'll see you next time on WOSN.